Lecture number 10. Your money, your resources, and your energy right behind these forces that are trying to destroy freedom on the earth. Now we had a little taste of that in 2 Nephi. We're going to get some more of it as we go a little bit further up. And um, right after Father Lehi had given his wonderful instructions to the uh, saints of his day, to his children, he passed away and almost immediately you find Nephi in great trouble. What got him in trouble? What got Nephi in trouble? He got himself into a controversial discussion. That's what happened. He became controversial. Now you've got to get used to that. Every once in a while I'll hear, um, well maybe the... Um, the people discussing who shall be on our campus as speakers. And I'll hear some say, well, of course, don't invite him. He's controversial. And I just can't tolerate that kind of an excuse for objecting to a man. Uh, I say, all right, now tell me specifically why he shouldn't be invited. He might be the prophet of God and be controversial. Don't use those words to describe why you're keeping him away. We want those that stand for truth and understanding and so forth. I don't worry about whether or not he's controversial. Right? Don't let anybody use that term on you. Um, the prophets of God have always been controversial. Men who stood for right were always controversial. Lewin Hoke was controversial. Galileo was controversial. George Washington was controversial. That doesn't automatically make them evil. If you're looking for people who are just a, a dose of pablum, that will slip down easy and not cause any uh, disturbance of your thinking. Well, that's the way Lucifer leads us gently down to hell, the Book of Mormon says. Well, Nephi became controversial. And all of a sudden, he was tempted to do something. Is he a little fellow, little scrawny fellow, or is he a man with Arnold Freeberg muscles? Which is he? Though I was young, I was large of stature. He's got some brothers that are planning what? What are they planning? To kill him. Probably in his sleep. Or in any event to gang up on him and kill him. Is he capable of taking a little defensive action? And taking care of himself? Physically? Yes, he is. Especially if he does it like Israel does ahead of time. Israel waited on Egypt this time, and now she's have, she has to go back. The other two wars, Israel struck first right after she found out they were on the way, but this time she let them actually invade and now is retaliating. Any question in your mind about who's going to win that war in the Middle East? You've been reading it all through the Book of Mormon. The Israelis are um, very concerned about whether or not they'll be able to make it. But you, you can be sure they will. The odds are all against them. Militarily, the odds are all against them. It's fantastic. They just keep, keep winning. And interestingly enough, nobody helps them. Every time the chips are really down, everybody backs off. The United Nations is supposed to intervene in a situation like this. Can't even make up its mind to hold a security conference, security council conference. Britain's backed off. The United States is standing there with the Sixth Fleet. Uh, I don't know how long we'll stand there. We intervened on behalf of the Arabs before when Nasser attacked his fellow Arabs. We intervened in 1958, landed Marines in, in uh, Lebanon, etc., to keep uh, a free country from being conquered. We're committed to freedom. That's really our policy. But anyway, little Israel's always had to fight her battles alone. And she's fighting it alone this time, making little protest. Now, if you know the Arab people, they are a lovable people, and they make wonderful members of the church, and it just breaks my heart to see them propagandized and agitated into these ridiculous attacks. As I tell my friends, don't attack the Jews. They don't need any more land. <laughs> They've got all about all they're entitled to. As Moshe Dayan says, if you don't leave us alone, we're going to go into Cairo and liberate the Egyptians. And we'll go into Damascus and liberate the Syrians, both of whom are under dictatorial authority. He says, we're just getting sick and tired of these warmongers preying upon us. Well, Nephi, feeling the, um, the necessity of uh, keeping his feelings under control and not retaliating, waits upon the Lord. 
And did the Lord uh, rescue him now from the threats of his brothers who want to kill him? Did the Lord rescue him? What did he tell him to do? Run. No. That's not very heroic. I mean, he's capable of taking on these fellows, really. He's even got the sword of Laban. The Lord says, flee. Now, it turns out he must have done it very secretly. I wish we had the details of that story because he got away from the four families that wanted to kill him, the two sons of Ishmael and Laman and Lemuel's families. All the rest of them were able to get away from the camp, which they had been uh, building, you see, here for many years, and get off without their being followed. In fact, it took years and years before the Lamanites finally found out where they went. Now, we know where they went. And it's an interesting story. We've been able to figure out a few details we wouldn't otherwise know, and we'll refer to the map. Now, by the end of this semester, you'll know every city that's on that map. And one of your final examinations will be to draw the map and put all the cities in. Every one of these cities will be so familiar to you. And when you're in priesthood or relief society, you'll just amaze everybody uh, with uh, knowing where Nephi is and... You'll know where the city of Moroni is and Morianton and Mulek and, and you'll know all the stories connected with them. You'll amaze yourselves and your teachers. Now, we know that they landed down south. I've got to put the map up higher here. They landed somewhere down here. Later, when uh, the four sons of King Mosiah come down to convert the Lamanites, they will go to the city of Ishmael and they will call it the place of their first inheritance. But it's, it turns out to be not of the Lamanites and the Lemuelites, but of the Ishmaelites, the, four, the two sons of Ishmael. And they named the city Ishmael, but it's just directly west from where Nephi settled and right against the narrow strip of wilderness. So we think that Laman and Lemuel probably were just a little bit south of there. Now, we don't know where in the Western Hemisphere this map belongs. It looks like uh, the northern part of South America. If the, Brazil, if the valley of Brazil were inundated, there was a sea east about where the Amazon valley begins, or whether it was one of the large sections of Central America, we're just not quite sure yet. So we don't worry too much about that. The Lord will reveal it in due time. Now, when Nephi and his people departed in the wilderness, look where they went. They came into the wilderness until they hit this narrow strip of wilderness that goes from the sea east to the sea west. Now that was so terrible, those mountains were so high and so fierce that you could not penetrate them. And for 350 years, the Nephites were held tight against that narrow strip of wilderness and did not spill over into the beautiful Sidon Valley on the other side where God had established the Mulekites. And it brought them over across the Atlantic in their case and established them there. And they were, had become a mighty people while the Nephites were working their destiny out down south. For 350 years, uh, the Nephites were held right here against this narrow strip of wilderness in their capital city, which we have called Nephi. It took the Lamanites, as I say, many years to discover actually where they had gone, but when they found them and found their lovely cities and their crops, nice uh, uh, fields all cultivated, why they immediately began to attack and say, we want some too that you've prospered in raising. Well, it was a prosperous city. Nephi immediately started building nice homes. And uh, what was their main building? Their main building was a temple. Copied after whose temple? Solomon's. Now, the early settler, the early critics of the Book of Mormon said, now that's ridiculous because the Jews who had only one temple, they didn't believe in having more than one temple. And uh, their ignorance has now been uh, exposed and we have now actually discovered uh, the writings of some of the Jews who had to flee clear down near the Aswan Dam in Egypt. And we actually have the letters in which they write back to Jerusalem and uh, say, we built a temple and it's been destroyed. May we have permission to build another one? The word come back, by all means, build a temple and offer sacrifices. Just blasted that uh, apostate religious theological uh, uh, co concept concerning temple worship that you can only have one not at all you can have many and, the, and the, in all of the cities they begin building temples after when the when the Christ comes he's going to come to bountiful not Zarahemla not Nephi he's going to come clear up near the narrow neck of land and appear at the temple so they built many temples 
Well, I just wanted you to remember that it's right up against the narrow strip of wilderness that they will be held for 350 years. Then they're going to spill over, discover the the Mulekites, just as the Mulekites have discovered the last of the Jaredites who are up in uh, the land northward. All three peoples will live simultaneously together. Now, your book has a breakthrough. It doesn't appear in any of other the church uh, books, but many of the Book of Mormon scholars have known for quite some time that the Jaredites were not wiped out right at the time that Lehi arrived in 600 B.C., about, uh, they weren't wiped out uh, by civil war until nearly 250 B.C. So all three peoples lived together contemporaneously for many, many years. Now that'll begin to unfold in your mind. One of the things that's exciting now about studying the Book of Mormon is we've solved many of the problems. By we, I mean um, the generation just ahead of you. Those scholars have penetrated many of the difficult problems in putting it together. Now there are other things that you need to do. Use that as a foundation and climb on up. So you'll notice that Mo Nephi says, and I taught them how to build with wood. I taught them how to use silver and gold and iron and zinc and these other things, uh, um, brass. We're not sure whether they used much zinc or not, but they, they did use a lot of copper and tin together to make bronze. They say brass in the Old Testament a lot of the times, but um, we d distinguish between them. Bronze is what they really use, but that's the modern term for it. The old term is brass. But tin and copper make bronze, and zinc and copper make brass. Okay? Try to get that clear in your book. Now, after they had settled there for a while, and when, um, when uh, Nephi was about 46, the Lord told him to make a new set of plates. So they'd been there about, it's about 30 years out of Jerusalem now. And 30 plus 16 makes 46, doesn't it? So Nephi is about 46 when the Lord says, now make some new plates and emphasize only the spiritual things. So that's the plates, it turns out, that we're now reading. Uh, the big plates we don't have. They're still in existence, but we don't have them. Then when he's 56, we get into the sermons of Jacob in which he says to his brother, now you teach the people that the things that are in Isaiah because that's all about the latter days I saw. I got to see all the latter days and Isaiah saw all the latter days and so will you tell them all about the latter days? You're a great speaker and you tell them. So we got all those wonderful teachings from Jacob which includes an additional... Uh, uh, dissertation on the atonement and now I must stop and make sure there's some things you understand about the atonement. What is the source of God's power? What is the source of God's power? Pardon? Doing what? The, what's the magic word? Obedience or honoring him. When they obey him and honor. He says in the Doctrine and Covenants, my honor is my power. All those intelligences out in the universe, they're in every electron, every atom is a whole universe of little intelligences and bits of matter. A molecule is a, a galaxy practically, if we could see way down into it. And your body is a universe. This thing that, that you call your body, which seems kind of tiny really, is a magnificent, monumental organization of intelligence and matter, the building blocks of the universe. That's why it is a temple of God. Uh, section 29, verse 38. My, my uh, honor is my power. My honor is my power. Uh, these, verse, these references are in your book. Just That's why I wanted you to read each, uh, every page of the, and the commentary on the first 12 chapters of 2nd Nephi so that you should be sure that you got a lot of that do deep doctrine all right what is the source of God's power his honor the honor that comes to him from the intelligences who obey him if you said obedience of the intelligences that would be true too it's not the exact word just so you understand what makes a God God what makes a, a bishop a great bishop the honor that he receives from those in his uh, congregation isn't it you see, you get your appointment of bishop from above. Where do you get your power as a bishop? What, what, see, this is the priesthood principle. What, what makes you a powerful bishop? 
being honored by those that you ask to do things. They do their home teaching. They teach their class as well. The deacons are in attendance. Even the elders can come out now, not just the high priest. You see? That's what makes a great bishop. That's what makes a great stake president. You know what makes a great prophet? A powerful prophet in the earth. What makes a great prophet? When he's being honored by the saints and sustained by the saints as a prophet. Can you kind of keep that priesthood principle in mind? Because this is a breakthrough in the gospel. It was in the scriptures all the time. And we kind of missed it. So we're getting it up into the mainstream of LDS thought where it belongs. Now, <clears throat> did Nephi and his people prosper in this new land where they were? What had happened to the Lamanites in that one generation? What happened to them? They became a dark-skinned people. Now, Lord has nothing against dark skin. He loves nice golden skin. I'm sure he wouldn't have made so many. But what did he use the dark skin in this case for? It identified what? It identified what? A culture, an attitude, which represented apostasy. And he said, I'm actually trying, I've deliberately made those who've apostatized uh, so that they're not attractive to you. Because he said, I don't want you to do what? I don't want you to intermarry with those who've apostatized. And he says, I do this only until they what? Repent. Otherwise, he said, if you will intermarry with the apostate groups, your seed will become like whom? Yeah, you become like, you're, you're going down a level. Now, I want you to notice, don't get any ideas about uh, skin coloring being significant to God because a little later on you're going to have Jacob just uh, lacerating the Nephites for not being as good to their families as the Lamanites are. He said, you, you talk about their dark skins and the curse thereof. He said, I want to tell you their spirits are whiter than yours. He said, you're immoral. You're apostate. So this idea of racial prejudice creeps into the mind very readily and often attaches to color of skin. And those of us who are just a little dark complexioned like to be thought, you know, that we're, we're doing as well as those who are blonde and blue-eyed. Right? Okay. <clears throat> That's just for fun. But to kind of be sure that we don't uh, decide people are good or bad in terms of color of skin. Now it talks about the last days, and that's really what um, Nephi wanted to emphasize, that the Jews would return and Israel would be begin to commence to be gathered out uh, and would come together. When are the Jews going to go back to Jerusalem voluntarily? This is an important doctrine. The ones that are over there now, did they joyfully go back to Jerusalem uh, to, um, uh, from prosperous circumstances to build it up? How did they happen to get in Jerusalem? They're refugees. Three million of them now. Uh, the ones that uh, are not refugees number in a few thousand. All the rest of them are there because they just weren't allowed to go anywhere else. Now, the, where are the majority of the Jews today? Have they gathered yet? No, where are they? They're in Beverly Hills and in the Bronx and in Miami. And uh, are they one day going to gather? Joyfully. When? When they believe in the Messiah. And after the Messiah appears among them, it isn't going to be very difficult after he saved them in Jerusalem to knock on the doors in Beverly Hills and say, have you heard what's happened in Israel? Yes, the Messiah has come. Would you like to know more? Yeah. See, that'll be the golden questions to the Jews. <laughs> and then there we, they, will, they are going to have their day and we'll convert them. Now we're converting a few. We have one here on our campus now who is a convert from Jerusalem. He's the number one convert from Jerusalem, converted in Jerusalem. He's now on the campus. We've converted several Jewish students who came to BYU and were converted while they were here. But to convert them in Jerusalem is not easy. Now it says, um, chapter 50 of Isaiah, which is 2 Nephi chapter 7, is directed to anti-Zionist Jews, to Arabs, and to other people who do not believe in this gathering. They're going to stop it. They're going to wipe it out. Did you have a question? You say, don't they hold their own? Yes. Book of Mormon says they'll never be driven out. Once they start gathering, they'll never be driven out. And let me just share something with you, lest I forget to mention it to you. You know, we've talked about how, the, how can the Jews build their temple when the Dome of the Rock is there over the spot, apparently. 
I have felt for a long time that probably what will happen is that during one of these wars and the bombings of Jerusalem, Dome of the Rock is going to be destroyed by its own people. It's probably the second most beautiful building in the world, many architects think. But just kind of put that down in your book. I won't be a bit surprised if the Dome of the Rock is destroyed by its own people. The Jews say they're not going to destroy it. And you remember when they asked the rabbi, how are you going to build your temple in the spot where Solomon's temple used to be when the Dome of the Rock is on it? And you say you're not going to destroy it. Then how are you going to build your temple? And the rabbi said, that's God's problem. The Dome of the Rock was built by the Mohammedans, or the Islamis, the Islamic people, over the spot where um, the son of Abraham was offered as a sacrifice. It's the top of Mount Moriah, you see. It's the spot where the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple was. It's the spot where Muhammad says he went to heaven on a white horse and received the Islamic religion from Adam and Moses and Jesus. They do. And the Jews honor it and they do not desecrate it. They treat it as though, as the Jews said to the Arabs, you're not a conquered people. Uh, but we don't even allow our own people to riot. So don't riot. We move in with machine guns. We don't care whether Jews or Arabs. Keep the peace. Pay your taxes. <laughs> Pax Romana. Uh, okay, um, now that, uh, that 50th chapter then is the, the Lord talking to Isaiah and he said in the latter days now you people I did not forget you I didn't put you away I can restore you now do you know what the, um, what the Arabs and the anti-Jewish anti-Zionist Jews say is happening in Israel they, they say we believe the Bible how can they believe the Bible and not have a gathering in Israel they've got the thing all worked out and um when we have one of them speak here on our campus each time, he, he says, now the Jews were promised that they could gather back to Israel. They were taken out to Babylon, they were allowed to come back to Jerusalem, and then they muffed it. The Romans drove them out, and they have no promise of another return. And I, I said to Mr. Lilienthal when he was on campus, and he and I had a, a so-called debate, I said, Mr. Lilienthal, will you accept what the Bible says about the gathering? He said, yes, that's our sacred book. All right, I, and then we flipped back and I said, now notice that when the final gathering comes, the Messiah appears and saves the people. Did that happen uh, when the people were allowed to return in 538 B.C.? When they came back from Babylon, did they have the Messiah among them? Well, not that I remember. No, they did not. And, the, and Isaiah talks about uh, other nations driving out the Jews and dispersing them all over the world, meaning other than Babylon. And it, with the other nations, was Rome, the Eastern and the Western Empire. Oh, he said, you Mormons have an answer for everything. <laughs> but it isn't the Mormons that have an answer for everything. The scriptures have the answer. And so as I say to my Arab friends, don't fall for that propaganda that the Jews only return to their homeland once. Just as we say to the Jews, don't fall for the propaganda that your Messiah only comes once. He came twice, and you return to your land twice. Don't try to play down the scriptures below what they say. Let them tell their own story. Now, the, the, there was a promise of the Lord to America. Will a king ever invade and conquer America? It never will, because this is God's headquarters in the latter days. Are we likely to get a threshing, however? Yes. And from whence will our greatest danger come, externally or internally? All the prophets say it's an internal threat. Now the 21st chapter of 3rd Nephi that you'll be studying next semester is God's promise that if we can kept, keep the Gentiles of this nation from going totally apostate, the nation will be preserved and they will help us build a new Jerusalem or help those who, of the saints who survive build a new Jerusalem. Now therefore Isaiah says, Zion must arise and put on her beautiful garments. And we actually, and, and the, break the bands from off your neck, which are the curses that have been plaguing these people. And when you go among them in Israel today, you can see that they're still under the, under the bands of the curse of 50, 2,500 years of apostasy. And, and they, they, 
a few of them are struggling up, but many of them are still under that that ban. Now, um, I just have one other question I think I missed on the atonement. Let me just ask it quickly. What is it that cuts us off from our Heavenly Father while we're in this second estate? What is it that cuts us off? Why won't the intelligences justify the Father in communicating like he always did with us? Why are we cut off? We're cut off by the law, aren't we? The law. These little intelligences say now, it held us back when we were disobedient. We're way down here as rocks and plants and, and animals and so forth. Um, now, they've been no disobedient. Apply the law. And the Father says, I will. I will. Can God look upon sin with the least degree of allowance? No. All right. It's the law that cuts us off. Then what is it that gets us back? The principle of mercy, compassion that Jesus is suffering, uh, inspired in all of these little intelligence so that when Jesus says, now they, they did the best they could, they really tried, they repented, for my sake won't you let them come up and they'll say, for your sake, yes, not for theirs, the rascals, <laughs> but for your sake we will. So we are taken back on the principle of love and mercy. Don't forget that. Those are the two things to keep in mind on the atonement.